After we put out a recent video looking at the preliminary accident report for the Swift Air slash DHL 737-400 crash in Lithuania, there were many, many interesting comments from viewers. While it seems impossible these days to avoid trolls blaming Boeing just for the sake of blaming Boeing, there were also some people questioning why exactly the overhead panel, a factor in the aircraft going down, was designed in the way that it was. While we won't explain the exact logic for this specific layout, it does seem like a good opportunity to look at cockpit design and how it may influence how pilots fly and respond to irregularities. We should first very briefly explain the cockpit panel factor in the Swift Air crash for those who didn't already watch the video. The crew, possibly fatigued, were seemingly distracted by frequency changes and being on the correct channel to contact air traffic control. There were also concerns about icing and the need to engage the anti-ice switches. The report mentioned that the cockpit voice recorder picked up an audible double click, which is believed to be one of the pilots accidentally switching the electric one and engine two switches from on to off. As you can see, the engine anti-ice switches are perfectly aligned vertically with the hydraulic electric slash engine switches for system B. So, the leading theory is that a pilot intended to turn engine anti-ice on, but somehow turned off the hydraulic system. Speaking with commercial airline pilot and former Simple Flying contributor Jack Hurstam, he highlights that the pilots were flying night IMC, or instrument meteorological conditions, meaning it was a dark cockpit. Crew were busy and didn't catch the mistake. An oral alert was later triggered and a master caution light was also triggered but was immediately cancelled by the crew. So Jack notes that the pilots had an opportunity to rectify their inadvertent hydraulic system shutdown when the master caution light and oral warning sounded, but for whatever reason they reflexively silenced it and did not look for a root cause. With that quick recap out of the way, there have been some questions from many non-pilots about the systems involved. Firstly, why is there even a need to disable the hydraulic system? Someone commenting on the previous video familiar with operating the Boeing 737, including the Dash 400, kindly explained this in simpler terms, telling us that the 737 has two separate hydraulic systems, System A and System B. Each system is powered by an engine-driven hydraulic pump and an electrically-driven hydraulic pump. These switches are provided to turn off the hydraulic system or an individual pump in the event of an overheat, failure or fire. They also allow for the system to be turned off for maintenance to safely work on the airplane without 3,000 psi of hydraulic pressure present in the lines. Additionally, the system may be turned off at the end of the flying day, although airline procedures vary. So that is why such functions exist in the cockpit. But there is a safeguard if the system is disabled accidentally, the master caution warning lights. And so this commenter goes on to explain that when a pilot turns off both the hydraulic switches on either the A or B systems by physically moving the switch to the off position, that action almost immediately turns on the respective hydraulic pressure low yellow caution slash warning light on the hydraulic panel. Because the hydraulic panel is located on the overhead panel above the pilot's heads and out of the direct line of sight, it also immediately illuminates the two yellow master caution lights located directly in front of each pilot on the glare shield. Master caution warning lights are intended to immediately alert the pilots of a detected system abnormality, and they are nearly impossible to miss when illuminated. Again, in the Swift Air incident, pilots appeared to reflexively silence these warnings. And so, what role did cockpit panel design play in all of this? Well, it should be obvious by now that switches with the same motion slash movement and feel placed next to each other establish the conditions for this human error. Jack, from his perspective and experience, would say that such a design and placement is less than ideal, but not necessarily bad design. Indeed, tens of thousands of flights with such aircraft have occurred with very few flights crashing due to accidentally shutting off the hydraulic system. Admittedly, this may not be the best argument, but pilots have mistaken the anti-ice and hydraulic system switches before, but such mistakes have been quickly remedied because there are warning systems and other indicators that something has gone wrong, such as autopilot disconnecting, flaps retracting if extended, the master caution, etc. 
Perhaps a good indicator that there was room for improvement is the fact that newer jets are different. Jack highlights that everything from the A220, 320, 75 767, 777 and 787 has hydraulic system switches or buttons offset laterally from the anti-ice selectors. He adds that many newer design philosophies have eliminated the need for pilots to manually actuate anti-ice systems in flight. Rather, the default in-flight selection is auto for engine and wing anti-ice. Such design eliminates the need for pilots to manipulate anti-ice systems unless a non-normal situation is encountered. For example, Jack explains that Boeing 757 pilots manually actuate engine anti-ice while in-flight and on-ground icing conditions exist. On the other hand, 767s use the auto feature for engine and wing anti-ice in-flight, but must manually manipulate the engine anti-ice if icing conditions exist on the ground by moving the selectors from auto to on. The bottom line, he says, is that pilots need to understand the systems of the planes they are typed to fly. Jack offers something else for consideration. On all clean sheet transport category jets designed after 1980, the pilots have some form of ICAS, which stands for Engine Indicating and Crew Alerting System. It's a screen like this, which displays engine parameters and alerts the crew to system configuration or faults. In the case where a hydraulic system is lost slash turned off in flight, the pilots will be alerted not only by a master caution or warning, but by an ICAS status or warning message. On the 737, pilots get the master caution or warning, but they have to look up at the overhead to determine what the root cause of the warning is rather than having it enunciated to them on an ICAS. Some pilots say this is a big deal, while others find it a minor difference. And so, perhaps a human factors specialist could assert that having to look up and search for a root cause via an amber light on the overhead panel at night after flying through one circadian low while also task-saturated is harder than having the fault clearly enunciated on an ICAS display. And so, to conclude this video, yes, design was a factor, but the aircraft was also designed with other warnings to help pilots recover from making such mistakes. Ultimately, it's rare that a single thing causes something as catastrophic as an airplane crash. It's not just a bird strike. It's not just one human error or the design of a cockpit panel. As we've seen over and over again, it's much more common to have multiple factors, a series of unfortunate events, contribute to a catastrophic accident.